Welcome to the Couch GM podcast. You can find the full video version of this podcast on YouTube at the Couch GM. You can also find the audio only version across any major podcast platform that you prefer. You can also find me on social medias at Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you name it. Just type in the Couch GM and you'll see the guy sitting on the couch throwing a baseball. If this is your first time watching, make sure to hit that subscribe button and let's get into it. All right, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. Today we're jo joined by Joe Doyle, who is a senior analyst with uh, the Future Stars series. So first off, Joy, or uh, sorry, Joe, thank you for taking the time today. Absolutely, man. Nice to have, uh, nice to be on. So today we're going to be talking all things uh, 2023 MLB draft. Uh, we'll get into the Mariners draft and some of the picks that they had. Um, and then I also want to hear kind of some of your story with how you got into what you're doing today, kind of your process with reviewing you know, prospects and all that type of thing. So yeah, if you want to introduce yourself first off and then we can get into the Mariners draft. Yeah, man. So uh, like you said, thank you for the introduction. Uh, name is Joe Doyle. Um, yeah, man. So I've, I've been writing since 2014. Uh, I really centered in on baseball in 2017 and have been writing for a couple of different sites ever since, uh, born and raised in Seattle, Washington, never left, uh, attended Washington state university, um, but yeah, I mean, go baseball Cougs. has kind of be, yeah, there you go. Go Cougs. Uh, baseball has just kind of become my life. Um, and, uh, I enjoy the, really the intricacies of the game. Yeah. And, and you are very detailed on your, your, your reports and there's so many, you know, prospects all throughout the country, high schoolers, college. Um, I guess a, a first question is kind of, yeah. What does your process look like as far as, um, your day-to-day -day type thing and, and analyzing players? Yeah, so I would say as of about four years ago, I got really into the numbers. Just I, I got really into being able to like quantify a player rather than just um, anecdotally kind of qualify a player. So, you know, being able to grade a fastball based on its pitch metrics and being able to grade a power hitter based on a large sample of batted ball data, I got really, really into that. And so, when I combined that with just my love of going to games and, and watching baseball and watching players, it kind of um, organically turned into a process. So what I like to generally do is when I'm evaluating these players, I like to either see them in person or get as much film as I can possible. Now, there's different tools that I use to watch uh, tons of film, but um, I like to start with some sort of live look so you can kind of quantify their athleticism and stuff like that. From there, I, I compare what I'm seeing with my eyes to some of the different data points that you can find publicly and then some other tools that are a little bit more private in terms of um, qualifying these players and scouting and evaluating these players. And then it kind of paints a whole picture. I, I do that two or three times throughout the course of a cycle. And um, it, it helps kind of write the entire story for me. So I assume that this cycle kind of just wrapped up. Is that correct? With the MLB draft being the, the peak of a cycle? Yeah. So when we're recording today, uh, it's signing day for the MLB draft. This will be it. Those guys will all go into minor league baseball. I mean, obviously the the grind doesn't stop with those guys. I still write about minor league prospects a whole bunch. Um, so continuing to evaluate how these guys are growing and developing is obviously part of the process. But for any given MLB draft cycle, um, especially now that I'm about four or five years into my process. Uh, every draft cycle takes about two years, about 24 months, getting first looks on guys and then, yeah, culminating in, in their draft day. So the MLB draft itself, the event is always a really cool payoff for me personally, selfishly, just because I've you know, written so much about these guys and watched so much film that it's nice to see them end up getting drafted and kind of uh, validating kind of the things that you've seen and, uh, you know, big league scouts, kind of agreeing with you in some different ways. Yeah. And so is it 150 or 250, the amount of players that you're making a list on? Oh God, no, <laughs> I wish it or was man. This, yeah, this year I ended up writing 986 scouting reports. Oh my word. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I published 614. I wanted to land on 614 this year because that's the amount of players that were drafted. And I figured you know, going forward, let's just see if I can improve my percentages year over year for the players that are drafted. Because the hardest part with this process is once you get on a day three, 
and rounds 11 through 20, it's the JUCO guys. It's the D2 guys. It's the D3 guys. It's, you know, the high schoolers out of Idaho that nobody has seen that (laughs) one scout saw, you know, so being able to hit a higher and higher number percentage wise, I think is a goal of mine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gone up year over year. I think the first year, 2019, I did 350 or something like that. And, uh, this year, just because you see so many players year over year, it just continues to grow. So I can tell you 2024 is already at 670 reports that I'm continuously, um, kind of tinkering with, but it never, I mean, it literally never stops. There's not a day that goes by that. I don't edit a report on some player. Yeah. And then, uh, for 2023's draft, what percentage of like, what, what's your kind of accuracy that you, you, you would say you had, you know, I haven't had a chance to actually go out and add it up yet. I plan on it. I think I got about 497, I think. And that's That's kind of just, I was, I was adding them up in the car on the way. Oh, I don't even know what it was. I think it was on the way to the all-star game. Uh, my buddy was driving to Seattle and I was just adding it up as they round, uh, ended round 20. And I, I was somewhere at like 130 guys or 125 guys that I did not write up that ended up getting drafted. So um, yeah, I don't know, do the, do the math, 78, 80%, something like that, which is, I think for the first year of ever doing this, I think I set a mark that is going to be very hard to replicate if I'm being totally honest with you. <laughs> No, absolutely. And, and really, at least from my perspective, you know, when I'm looking at prospect information, really anywhere, it's like, you know, I'm on Twitter, actively on Twitter. It's a lot of your stuff that I'm seeing, you know, breakdowns on these guys. And that's kind of the source that you look for when your team drafts someone. So yeah, with that, um, let's get into the 2023 MLB draft. And uh, we heard Scott Hunter, the uh, Mariners director of amateur scouting, talking about how deep this draft was in particular and specifically in position players in the high school ranks. Um, can you kind of speak to that and, and how this draft panned out from that sense? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, I think, you know, Jerry Depoto came out and said it was the deepest draft he's ever seen. I agree with that to a certain extent. I, I think I said this on, on the radio as well. I, it was the best top 100 players that I've ever seen, um, at least since like 2005, um, So the depth in the first, you know, three or four rounds was pretty extraordinary. Uh, The high school talent was pretty exceptional as well. I don't think the top end of it was quite as good as 2021 with Jordan Lawler and, um, you know, Brady House and Marcelo Meyer. But I do think in terms of like the high school talent inside of the top 50 picks, guys that project to go on to be big league regulars, I think it was pretty strong. So, yeah, I mean. I, I really think Seattle capitalized on that. Like Johnny Farmella was a guy that I'd talked to some scouts that thought he should be a top 20 pick. Um, he was inconsistent, but the raw tools are just incredible. Um, Ty Pete was a guy that was a little bit enigmatic just because, you know, he did have the arm injury and um, he was slowed by that. And he was kind of a late bloomer in terms of impact at the plate. Um, so I think he was kind of appropriately picked. I think he fit somewhere in that 30 to 45 range. And then Colt Emerson, I know I can tell you firsthand Colt Emerson had teams calling on him at the 13, 14, 15, 16 range. Uh, Those teams were ultimately uh, looking for a deal. They were looking to kind of uh, parlay Colt into uh, maybe another player in the second round, but he had tons of interest inside the top 15 picks. So I would say Seattle did very, very well. It was, you know, a risky approach taking three high school players in the top 30 picks. But uh, when the class looked the way that it did, I think they just went for as much upside as they could and, um, walked away with a pretty good package. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was watching it live and I was kind of hoping that maybe the Mariners would take, you know, like a, a, an infielder at some point in college, because I mean, and like Ryan Divish said, when I talked to him before, you know, a team doesn't want to draft depending on what their current needs are, because that will, you know, strap you down long-term. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it seems that they just went for the highest upside young guys, the most to- toolsy guys. And I mean, you know, most of them are shortstops. Johnny's an outfielder, but the most athletic position on the field is going to be shortstop center field. So you can move them around wherever you need them eventually. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were certainly college infielders that I think Seattle would have jumped all over had they been on the board, you know, Braden Taylor, Tommy Troy, Matt Shaw. Right. I think the team was probably expecting just the way that the board looked and the strength of the high school class. 
I think they probably expected some high schoolers to get picked in the 12 to 20 range. And that really didn't happen as much. It was just everyone was capitalizing on the college bats. So had one of those guys been there at 22, Seattle probably would have zigged instead of zagged the way that they did. And, you know, maybe they try to buy Colt Emerson down to 29, but the way that it shook out is the way that it shook out. And I think Seattle made sure to um, stay close to their process and take the best player available that was on their board. Absolutely. And then um, soon after the first round, and let's pull it up here, they took uh, their first um, college guy, which was uh, Ben Williamson. Uh, what do you have or what have you seen from Ben? Yeah, so Ben Williamson was a very interesting player in this class. I think a lot of people would agree he was, if not the best, one of the top two or three upper class college performers in, in, this, in this class. He had big data, uh, fantastic swing decisions a way better athlete than people are probably giving him credit for. Like he could get by as a pretty ordinary or maybe a fringy shortstop. Like he's, he can really move. Um, yeah. I do think the comparisons to Tyler Locklear are unfounded. He's a way better athlete than Locklear. He's got a way better shot at staying at third base. And Tyler Locklear is way more power than Ben Williamson is. I think you're going to see more hit tool out of Williamson than you are out of Locklear. So uh, talking to scouts, nobody expected Williamson to get out of the fourth round. He was always going to be a priority money mover in the draft. If someone was going to take him in an effort to save at least $500,000 somewhere so they could buy up more high school talent. Um, but because Seattle went so heavy on the high school side, those first three picks, they needed to move money pretty quickly. Taking him in the second round, saving like $900,000. Uh, just a really fantastic player and a means to an end. Yeah, absolutely. And after we get through the draft stuff, um, I really want to I want to get into and kind of ask you about how teams are able to buy players down because I find that pretty mm -hmm. interesting and it sounds almost like tampering. I mean, you know, in other drafts, it's like you draft the guy and that's, you, you know, you're guaranteed to get that guy versus here. You can draft someone, but if so, a, another team is working out a deal, they might, might not sign with you. So I'm just kind of interested with how that process works. Yeah. Um, and then, so after Ben Williamson, they take uh, Teddy McGraw in the third round. And I saw, you know, the Wake Forest coach come out and say that Teddy McGraw could be the steal of the draft. And, you know, he's coming off of his second Tommy John, but he also said that if he were healthy, he could be on the tier of Paul Skeens, which is a very big say. Um it is coming from the Wake Forest coach, but what, what do you see with him? I mean, I would definitely pump the brakes on the Paul Skeens thing, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. um, listen, if you go back and search from some of my stuff in January, February, even I think as late as early March, um, I had Teddy McGraw a top 25 pick. Um, I was talking to scouts in the Carolinas, talking to cross checkers on the East Coast, guys that saw him on the Cape, um, up to 97, 98 with a bowling ball sinker really athletic mover and a slider that was routinely 88 to 89 and touching 91. So when you have that two pitch mix, you're going to be an explosive pitcher. He was never going to be a strikeout guy. I don't think, I mean, he was trying to learn a four seamer, but it wasn't really taking. So I think for that reason, he's never going to be necessarily a guy that's punching out a ton of batters, but he has a changeup. The sinker was the, the velocity was ticking up. It's a good body. Um, he understands pitch design, which I think is something players in general struggle to take to when they get to professional ball. So he should be able to apply some of the things that he learned in the Wake Forest pitching lab immediately uh, in professional baseball. We'll see whether or not he's ready to go at full strength in February or March. Um, but the stuff is there. You know, I don't know if the I'll say this about Teddy McGraw. I don't know if the strike throwing is going to be good enough to start. We'll see. Um, he had moments where he was brilliant in that regard and he had moments where he'd walk four batters in a start and the other part of that is his durability um, if he proves that he can you know withstand the rigors of being able to pitch five innings then I think he's got the stuff to be uh, a mid-rotation type of a guy and there's just not very many guys in college baseball that you're going to find that were throwing 98 mile an hour sinkers and 90 90 mile an hour sliders so the upside the ceiling obviously clear as day the risk is probably as sky high as anybody in this draft. Yeah. If you're messing around with the UCL, you know, twice now, um, there's definitely high risk there, but 
going for the upside. Um, and then down the rest of the list, are there other names in specific that you'd want to point out to, to Mariners fans? Um, I know there's, you know, another 17, 16 guys that were picked are, are do any of them stand out to you? Yeah. So the one guy that I am very excited for, I had him as a third round pick Brody Hopkins, righty out of Winthrop. Um, Brody Hopkins is on the Mount Rushmore. I've said this on other podcasts. He's on the Mount Rushmore of the most athletically gifted players in this class. He was playing center field for Winthrop. He was batting sometimes at the top of the lineup for Winthrop. I saw him jump over a catcher to score a run. Um, in a private workout for the San Diego Padres, he ran a 40-yard dash and then finished it off with a back handspring and a backflip What as a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I haven't even begun to talk about like what he actually does on the mound, uh, up to 98 with a bowling ball sinker, um, a really, really nasty slider and a pretty nascent changeup. But I will always be a talent ev evaluator that leans on athletes, like first and foremost, like give me an athlete, give me a guy that really knows how to move. And I will bet and gamble that he's going to unlock more and reach his ceiling quicker than others might you look at a guy like matt brash right like matt brash 91 to 93 at niagara touching 94 but an incredible mover very very lean a ton of projection you just kind of thought like this is a quick arm he's a quick mover down the mound he's gonna throw harder and now all of a sudden he's throwing 100 Brody hopkins is already doing all of those things and he was a position player and he can do a backflip i just <laughs> I wonder if he's going to throw enough strikes to actually start, but he could be, for me, another high leverage reliever pretty quickly for Seattle, but I would think that they're going to try and give him a chance to start. So like I said, I had him a third round pick. I thought he was one of those unicorn players in this draft that you simply couldn't find, like that, that don't grow on trees. And for that reason, I'll be really interested to see what Brody Hopkins becomes. Now, I do want to say, I do want to pump the brakes. <laughs> There's a lot of risk with this kid. Like he's not polished at all. Um, and he's barely been like truly pitching for about a year and a half. So there's a long ways to go. But again, I always lean toward guys that really know how to move and really know like how to be explosive. And Brody Hopkins is one of those guys. Yeah, that's, that's incredible that I definitely did not know any of that stuff. Um, we'll see if we can get, keep good. him out of the Olympics <laughs> and in the farm system, I guess. Um, yeah, no kidding. But yeah, speaking to his polish, uh, looks like last year in 2023, he had a walks per nine of 7.3. His uh, case mm -hmm. per nine were at 11. So definitely that, um, yeah, kind of effectively wild profile, you might say. I would say um, for now, I mean, the thing is, he's just, he's so green that you don't really know what it's going to become. Um, but the fact that he was striking out over 11 batters per nine, and I understand it was Winthrop, um, but the fact that he was striking out north of 11 batters per nine as a sinker baller is pretty rare. Like those guys break a lot of handles. They run it in on knuckles, get a lot of ground balls, but they're not ordinarily guys that are striking a ton of guys out. But you look at the walk rate. I think it's safe to say that, yeah, he was just an effectively wild type of righty. It always really Im impresses me when you hear about guys that started pitching just recently, like Bryce Miller didn't start pitching really until his senior year of high school. And now look at where he's at. This guy just started pitching a year and a half ago and he's already doing what, what he's doing. It's just, just incredible to me, the level of, as you mentioned, athlete that some of these guys mm -hmm. are, and that just plays, plays to their overall profile and, and their ceiling. Yeah. And it's not the only guy they did it with either. Illinois State um, righty Elijah Dale. I wrote him up. Uh, he was a shortstop at Kansas State. Um, and he's the exact same thing. Like it's a 3000 RPM slider. He throws pretty hard. He's extremely green on the mound. But when you see a guy that just moves like that as a former position player, you have to be pretty excited about what it could become. And so for that reason, I'm more excited about Brody Hopkins, but some of the other guys that they drafted in this class um, really have some exceptional traits about the way that they can throw the ball. Yeah. Okay. So Brody Hopkins, Elijah Dale, two names that we'll definitely keep in mind. Um, I'm curious kind of where these draft picks are going to be slotting into the Mariners farm system, you know, today and then moving forward. Do you have an idea of where mm -hmm. 
they currently might be? Yeah, I've got him on my list. Um, I put him in a couple days after the draft. So right now I have Colt Emerson at number five behind Brian Wu, who's going to graduate. Um, I have Cole Young, Harry Ford, and Gabby Gonzalez in that order, one through three. Colt Emerson will then be number four when Brian Wu um, graduates. Uh, I have Johnny Farmello at number eight. He'll be seven when Wu graduates. And then Ty Pete, I have at 11, and he'll be at number 10 when Brian Wu graduates. So some of the other guys you're going to find a little bit further down the list. Aiden Smith was a really exciting, good frame, right, right uh, outfielder. Um, he's going to be number 17. And then McGraw's at 23. Williamson is at 24. And some of the other guys like Hopkins, you can find in the top 30. But uh, the rest of them are, are, frankly, the rest of them have pretty high likelihoods of becoming relievers. So they're not going to break my top 30. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great news, um, you know, being that, the Mariners have graduated quite a few of their top prospects over the past few years, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, obviously Julio Kelnick, all these guys. And now they're able to, you know, put an additional three or four in their top 11 to 15 or 20. Um, that's a yeah. pretty solid pickup there. Yeah. I was saying um, as, as kind of a quick sidebar, it's kind of interesting. I tweeted this like a week ago when Brian Wu graduates, I think, all seven of the Mariners' top seven prospects will not be able to drink a beer, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> which insane. is insane. Uh, yeah. And I think it's going to be something like 11 of the top 12 or 11 of the top 13 will be under 21. So, um, yeah, I mean, with Seattle, the future is certainly the calling card with this farm system right now. And you'd kind of like to see what it looks like accelerated a year from now. Um, but they've certainly developed quite a bucket for reinforcements in 2025 and 2026 and they've definitely shown that they can you know produce top pitching with uh kirby gilbert uh Wu miller um so now it looks like they're going to be taking some chance on uh working some of those bats um i have yeah. so i have a question between brian Wu and bryce miller we've heard that bryce miller's fastball is elite because of the spin rate the spin efficiency that type of thing um, but we also hear that there's, or I see on baseball savant that Brian Wu has some incredible metrics with his fastball, um, on top of the sinker, who would you say has the higher upside on the fastball between those two? Well, on the fastball, it's Bryce Miller. I don't think it's terribly close. Um, okay. I do have a hot take though. I think like Brian Wu has such an outlier fastball and, or not uh, Brian Wu, Bryce Miller has such an outlier fastball that almost nobody in baseball can replicate it. And I think when you have that, he has to develop the secondaries to be able to let the fastball really kind of do the damage that it could do. And and he'll probably get there. But I will say, I think just in general, the player with the higher upside is, is probably Brian Wu. I think he's a better mover. Uh, I think he's got a better chance to start long-term. Um, I think he's got better feel for like developing shape on a slider. Whereas... Bryce Miller has to change his release point to kind of get the shape that he wants. And it's always going to be difficult for Bryce Miller to actually develop a sweeper as such an ultra vertical arm slot type of a guy. So I think personally, Brian Wu has the upside of a, of a low two or a high three. And I think Bryce Miller could also get there as well, but it's a little bit more effort in his delivery. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I personally, I like, I prefer the way Bryce uh, Brian Wu throws the ball to Bryce Miller, but there's like maybe one pitcher in baseball, maybe two if you include Degrom, um, that can replicate the shape that Bryce Miller puts on a fastball. It's just, nobody can do it. Yeah, and um, I I forget if it was Bryce Miller or Brian Wu that was compared to Joe Ryan. I think it was Bryce Miller with the fastball, with how they have that approach angle, and, and with his fastball because Joe Ryan's Joe Ryan's you know throwing ninety four but he still has great yeah. results on the fastball like if he was throwing in the upper nineties. Yeah. I mean, I've always compared Bryce. I, you can go find the tweets. I've compared Bryce Miller going back to September of 2022 to Spencer Strider. Um, I right. don't think, well, I, I know that he's not there right now with the slider. It's just, it is, there's a hump in it. Uh, he has to change his arm slot. Uh, it's inconsistent and, and you can see it in the numbers. Like hitters are picking up the slider out of the hand. And the changeup split that he's throwing is actually showing some teeth. So I think this is going to be a very big winter for Bryce Miller. I think if he has a similar type of development path to Logan Gilbert, 
uh, in terms of developing a slider, developing a splitter. Um, he could really turn into a number two type of a starter, maybe number one, but I think he's uh, another exceptional pitch weapon away from scratching that. Uh, Brian Wu, on the other hand, I think is is just scratching the surface of what he's capable of. I mean, he was hurt for so long. He's barely been able to like develop and understand pitch design and everything like that. So if I was comparing uh, these guys, I think Brian Wu is probably the better athlete. Um, but Bryce Miller, both of them have a sky high ceiling. And if you're the Mariners, you'd, you'd be reluctant to trade one of them uh, without knowing what you have. Yeah. And these uh, trade rumors that have been coming out, I don't know how much merit they have to them about, you know, them talking to the Cardinals about Logan Gilbert or young pitching for young hitting. Um, I just, that would be really hard to part with any of those guys in that rotation. Um, especially, you know, you got Robbie Ray coming back next year, Marco Gonzalez at some point. So there's going to be an overload of starting pitching, but at the same time, the upside with these guys are near the front of the rotation and that's tough to give up. Yeah. Um, so then with that, let's see here, let's get into the 2022 MLB draft. If, uh, you know, talking with, um, so Cole Young was taken first overall, you mentioned Locklear, um, some other guys. I was uh, sent a tweet by you um, from June of this year, actually, and where you said that Seattle might have really stolen a guy in the 2022 draft, 13th round pick Darren Bowen out of UNC guy. Pembroke. Can you speak to to what he has that special? It's my guy. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I'm on a bit of a I'm on a bit of a heater right now with these tweets about stealing pitchers. I th- I think I did the same thing with Brian Wu. Um, so Darren Bowen is going to be a bit more of a stretch. Uh, you know, <laughs> Wu was a high pick. Bryce Miller was a high pick. UNC Pembroke is a very small school. Uh, when Darren Bowen was drafted, I don't I I believe he was six two. 163 pounds or something like that. And I know that he was probably listed at like 175 or something. Um, but yeah, I think he was 6'2, 163. So the team has really made an emphasis on adding weight, but they've started to stretch him out a little bit. They've started to throw him over two and three inning outings. And for the same reasons that I fell in love with Bryce Miller and Brian Wu, Darren Bowen has a special, special fastball. Um, it's got a ton of carry through the zone. He's extremely athletic, very, very whippy. He's lean. Um, he moves like a starter. I think there's some um, operational cleanup that'll be necessary in terms of like getting him to repeat his delivery over and over. And he is already 22, so we're not talking about a guy that's a high schooler here. Um, so you kind of have to take that into account with projection. But you know, you're talking about a guy that hides the ball well. He moves really fast down the mound up to 98 um, tons of carry through the zone and he's still developing the slider. It's definitely flashed. The changeup is almost non-existent right now, but Darren Bowen, if he throws enough strikes, I think has a chance to start. And I think it could be a plus fastball with um, some promising secondaries coming. So we'll see. Yeah. I was just sent uh, that tweet. That was the first time that I heard his name. So um, interesting to see interesting to see where he goes to and then i don't know how much you watch do you, do you still follow up on guys you know when they're in the minor leagues a lot i'm curious on emerson hancock specifically just because you know there was inj- injury concern in the past you know this year from what i've heard he's been healthy the entire year but you know when there was the next call for a pitcher coming up when marco went down a lot of people were assuming that it was going to be emerson hancock not brian Wu, because of the innings restrictions that Brian Wu was going to have this year specifically. So what are you seeing out of Emerson Hancock? How, how's he doing? Well, the biggest thing with Hancock is, is he's missing more bats with the fastball, which is critical. Um, I, I think I've kind of proven this now with Brian Wu and Bryce Miller and Darren Bowen, like to be an effective starter at the big league level, you have to have a fastball that can miss bats because if people just sit on your fastball, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and, and Emerson Hancock always kind of got hit around a little bit. Um, he never had definitive shape on the fastball. He had a four seamer and a two seamer. Both of them would melt together and the slider and changeup were never good enough for him to get away with not having a strong fastball. So, you know, he's striking out close to 10 batters in inning um, right now at double a, which is, I believe the best in his career. If not, it's pretty close um, walks are up a little bit, but 
I would always say like, if, if you can improve your stuff and the sacrifice that you have to give up is uh, maybe an extra walk per outing, um, it's always going to be a, a, a solid trade-off. So I would be stunned if Seattle doesn't see Emerson Hancock in August uh, of 2023, barring an injury. Um, they just, they're going to need the innings the rest of the way. I can't imagine Brian Wu is going to be allowed to throw a hundred innings this year or 110 innings this year. So I'm, I'm sure Hancock will get his cup of coffee here um, in the next few weeks. And what I would look for is his, his ability to just miss bats with the fastball. I still don't think it's a, it's a special pitch. I think it's maybe solid average. Um, so it's not going to be anything that is necessarily getting a whole lot of outs, but if he does throw the fastball for strikes, uh, and and gets ahead. I think the slider and changeup and curveball are all good enough uh, to be competitive at the big league level. Now that being said, I don't think he's more than a number four starter right now, despite the fact he can get it up to 97. Um, he's going to be a pitch to contact guy more often than not, who probably posts numbers similar to. Oh man, I can't even I can't even put a name on a guy right now, but he'll he'll be a he'll be a solid innings eater better than like a Chris Flexen type of an arm for Seattle but um certainly not going to be a guy that shuts down lineups on any given night. Yeah, and uh Jared Poto on Seattle Sports 710, he talks every Thursday. This last Thursday he talked briefly about Brian Wu's innings limitations and how they might approach that. They talked about maybe, you know, skipping some starts or adding a sixth man to the rotation. So if Emerson Hancock were to come up at some point and be that sixth guy that would make sense there. And I've been, I've been excited to see him for a while, especially watching him in the futures game last year that, you know, 97 mile, mile an hour sinker looked fantastic. So, um, he yeah, can definitely get guys out. Yeah. I mean, this, the stuff is good. It's just not, I, I mean, it's so interesting. Baseball has changed so much. There are guys that throw, what we call hittable 99. Like you just, you can't sneak 99 <laughs> by a guy. I don't know how that's possible, but then you, as I kind of led this podcast off, like I really fell in love with the numbers, the why, like why a pitch isn't being effective. Why 92 at the top of the zone for some guys is so effective. And for others, it's just not. Um, and Emerson Hancock falls into that category. It's like, yeah, he throws 93 to 94, 95. He'll touch 97. Um, but it's just that fastball shape that, sometimes can can run into barrels because of the way that it moves back down into the into into the hitting zone so um, like i said he's gonna have to really rely on the change up in the slider and that nascent curveball but he's got the ability to throw enough strikes and he's got the ability to blow it by a guy and pitch backwards and obviously he's seasoned with a um, track record of pitching and, and i think now is probably the time for him to get his cup of coffee yeah absolutely and you mentioned that uh it's tough to to see how some guys throw 92 can miss bats. Whereas it's pretty easy to see how someone like Johan Duran, he's throwing 104 with a 99 mile an hour splitter is able to, to miss bats and be one of the best relievers in baseball, but that's a different profile. <laughs> Very different. Yeah. 104 is a little bit different than, which is crazy to say 104 <laughs> is a little different than 99, but like, I remember Seattle had a reliever like four or five years ago named Archimedes Caminero who would throw 98, 99 and just get pummeled. So, you know, the ability to hide the ball, the ability to be deceptive, the ability to spin the fastball above the barrel or below the barrel is very important. And that's my only concern with Hancock is does he have a fastball profile that's going to be able to, to miss the baseball bat? And we'll see. Yeah. Awesome. And then I wanted to get into a bit about, you know, how the, the draft signings work. I don't know if you have any insight. I, I don't have any insight into how that process works. Can you walk us through what that looks like? You know, how soon play, uh, teams are able to reach out to players that they might want to draft that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, um, so scouts can talk to players all year. Um, they can talk to the players advisors. They can get a feel for, um, you know, what they're expecting from a pro organization almost every player that you talk to and every agent that you talk to won't speak on the amount of money that they're looking for in the draft until probably three weeks at least before the draft, because frankly, these guys don't have a great feel for where they're going to slot. And um, so putting a number on their head doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, you know, mm -hmm. you, if you're a player's agent, you begin to talk to six, seven, eight, nine teams, get a good feel for where you think you're going to go in the draft. And then it kind of puts a presumed, uh, value in terms of like what the slot is 
at that at that draft spot. So uh, more often than not, a player will get a call a few picks before that they're going to be picked and say, hey, you know, we want to take you here. This is the number we want to take you at. What do you think? Um, and usually it's just a solid yes. Now, like I said, there are instances like Colt Emerson where teams will call and say, hey, we're very interested in taking you here. Uh, we want to save $800,000 on this pick. Are you okay with that? Um, and if that's the case, then um, the player says no. Um, so hold on. Do you want me to get the dog? Can you hear that? Uh, not too loud. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, the way that like being able to get a player to sign for less than their slot, it's all about leverage. And that specifically pertains to college players. So if you are a college junior, you don't really have the ability to go back to school because being drafted as a 23 year old, you got next to nothing. Like you don't have a backup plan. You have to go play professional baseball. Yeah. Um, so with, with leverage in mind, a lot of guys will just agree to whatever um, a team will offer them. And um, it's just, you know, it's just balancing the negotiating between like 10 or 12 teams. So, so in general, it's, it's more so, you know, high schoolers are going to, ask for a higher dollar amount up front in order to, you know, skip college, that type of thing. Is that a general rule? Exactly. exactly. So that's why uh, high school players have the ability to basically name their price, right? If you are Johnny Farmello and you come from an affluent family who already has plenty of money um, and you've been on the travel ball circuit and you have an expectation of what it would take for you to go pro and your backup plan is the University of Virginia, a school that you have dreamed about going to for your entire life, um, you can kind of have the ability to say, Hey, you know, you guys value me as the 40th best player in this class. I'm just going to tell you, you got to give me top 25 money or I'm, you know, I'm going to go to school. Uh, you can't say that if you are a college player, you know, if you are Dylan Cruz, for example, who was the number one pick Dylan Cruz can't be like, okay, well you have to give me $10 million or I'm going to go back to school for what, you know, if you go back to school, your draft stock isn't, it's certainly not going to go any higher. And if that's the case, um, you're just playing a losing game. So that's why high schoolers in general in the draft are so much more expensive. And this is a separate thing, but, and it might just be rumors, but I heard rumors that uh, Dylan Cruz was asking for a higher than slot or a high enough amount from the pirates to where the pirates ended up going skeins instead of Cruz. I'm not sure how much truth there is to that. And he didn't want to play in Pittsburgh. I mean, I certainly heard the same rumors. Um, I can't speak for whether or not they're true. It's a Scott Boris client. Scott Boris clients are not notoriously silent. Scott Boris is notoriously silent. But when you are Dylan Cruz and you are the quote unquote number one player in the draft, you do kind of have the flexibility of being able to posture and position yourself to go where you want to go. Now he didn't end up getting $10 million from the nationals, but if you tell the pirates that you're not going to sign unless you get $10 million or, you know, the other option there is you become a PR nightmare by saying, we told the pirates, we didn't want them to draft us. They still drafted us. We're not going to sign for 9.5. We're not going to sign for 9.6. And you just create that whirlwind storm. The pirates don't want anything to do with that either. Even though he ultimately probably would end up signing because he doesn't have a good backup plan. Um, you have the ability to kind of posture and position yourself to go to, let's say, the Nationals if you wanted to go to the Nationals. And I think there's a very real possibility that that could have happened here, but we'll never hear it uh, out of the Scott Boris camp. No chance. Yeah, and that just kind of reminds me of, I, I think it was John Elway when he was getting drafted, you know, deciding between baseball and football. He didn't want to go to a certain spot. And he was like, hey, if you draft me, I'm going to go play football type thing. Um, yep. Yeah. That's just, I mean, that's those guys really like there's there's examples of it all over the place uh like eli manning and the philip rivers thing in the 2004 nfl draft like that's right eli yeah. manning told the giants i'm not gonna or he told the chargers i'm not gonna play for you like i'm not gonna play for the chargers um so they draft what was it philip rivers and then philip rivers gets traded for eli manning and yeah i mean player agent sports politics can be a dirty game it's not always the best player available that gets picked sometimes it's just um the player that is really excited to play for your team yeah and then um before we wrap things up so the miami marlins uh in specific i think they're gonna have one of the deepest rotations for the next d decade really 
with you go through their starting rotation now, the guys that are high up in their rankings for prospects slash injury, like Sixto Sanchez. And then they draft Noble Meyer and Thomas White in this draft. And I was sitting there just shocked that they were able to get Thomas White, who's um, by most standards, the top lefty high schooler in the, in the draft on top of the top righty high schooler in the draft and Noble Meyer. Can you speak to Thomas White and Noble and what you see there? Yeah. So I've seen uh, Noble Meyer throw live and it is pretty exceptional. It's pretty crazy. He blew everyone away at the combine with his interviews. It's a kid that's 18 years old and he understands pitch design better than most college guys. Um, so for that reason, like Noble Meyer is going to be a stud if he stays healthy and Thomas White, I think, um, for me, like reviews were a little bit more mixed. I think there's still some concern on his fastball command and his ability to throw strikes with it. But when you're a six foot six inch lefty and you're 18 years old and you have a ton of projection ahead of you, like you just kind of bet on the idea of him kind of wrangling it in in the next four years. The slider and the changeup both showed that they could be out pitches. And, you know, six foot six inch lefties just don't grow on trees. You know, you kind of exactly. think back to David Price and things like that, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think the Marlins did something really well. Last year they took Jacob Berry and it was a it was a strange pick because he has next to no ceiling. The Marlins haven't proven that they can develop bats. It just was a very odd pick. But you look at the organization now and the fact that they've been able to develop so many good arms over the last few years. Just do what you're good at. Um, and so for that reason, like we're not even talking about Jake Eater, who is a lefty in their farm system who for my money might be one of the top five left-handed pitching prospects in the game. Um, and he has, he hasn't even pitched above double a yet. So yeah, they're in a really strong position to capitalize on their ability to develop arms. And I think whenever you have, as has been the case in Seattle, a revolving door of capable pitchers uh, coming through the ranks, you're always going to put yourself at least in a position to compete and certainly in a position to capitalize on your pitching depth on the trade market. So loved what the Marlins did this year. It is among the riskiest draft classes um, in major league baseball because high school arms are so volatile and fragile. But if both of those guys stay healthy and both of them amount to even 90% of what people think they could be, the Marlins could have a top five rotation in baseball for the next 10 years. Absolutely. You got Sandy Alcantara, Jesus Lizardo, Edward Cabrera, uh, you got Yuri Perez coming up now, and then you got like four guys that can be competing for that five spot on top of the, the rest of their farm system. So I'm really excited just to watch their rotation in specific. Yeah. And you know what? I'll say another thing. The Marlins have the financial flexibility too to go add like a dog. Like they could really go get um, a pretty nasty arm on the market. Their, their farm system has next to no bats coming up. Uh, they're in a pretty tough spot as it pertains to, um, bringing up offensive impact, but they've got the flexibility financially to go make that happen. And they've certainly got the trade capital to go do it. So in, in some ways they're in a similar position to the Mariners. Absolutely. Well, uh, Joe, I really appreciate your time and the insight that you have here. I'm a huge fan of your stuff. I'll continue to follow and uh, share your stuff and hopefully uh, we can get you on again and talk about more prospects in the future. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your stuff. It's really well done. And uh, I'll continue to follow along as well. All right. Thanks. Go Cougs and Mariners. <laughs> Go Cougs.